Hello everyone. It's not usual that we have the opportunity to interact with someone who has dedicated his life to the field of neuromodulation. I have with me today Dr. Hari Subramanian, senior fellow and chief scientist, research and development at Boston Scientific Neuromodulation. Hari is based out of LA and is a neuroscientist, neurophysiologist and neuromodulation expert leading the development of novel neuromodulation. We had the pleasure of hosting him today at one of our geriatric care center. And he also kindly consented to spend time with us, sharing some of his valuable experiences and latest development in this field. A very warm welcome to you, Dr. Hari Subramanian. Thank you so much for taking time to talk to us. It's my pleasure. Curious question to start with. What enticed you to uh, get into this field of neuromodulation? Well, I've always been wanting to study about the brain. When I finished my engineering here, I got a scholarship to go to Australia to do neuroscience. And uh, I did my PhD in the same laboratory where John Enkel's at discovered the synapse. He won the Nobel Prize for describing the synapse. So I started my PhD in the same, same laboratory and then I finished my PhD on respiratory neurophysiology because all I was interested in was how do you breathe and where is this neural structure that makes you breathe that gives you all the opportunities to walk and talk and discuss and the foundation of that is breathing. So I did my PhD on understanding how many neurons are there, how they are wired up, how they contribute to the diaphragmatic movement and how they disagree. You'll be very surprised to know that out of uh, one trillion neurons in the brain, there are less than about 4,000, 5,000 cells that are actually involved in diaphragmatic movement. Oh. And they are highly protected and they, they are programmed and they are so beautifully engineered that nothing can come anywhere close to it. Following that, I examined how we speak. So my concept of speech was, if you want to speak, you need to produce sound. So where is a sound being produced in the brain? Are there neural structures in the brain? So in those days, uh, Understanding how sound is produced in the brain was extremely complicated because if you are the animal, just like human beings, you cannot open your mouth, you cannot make a sound. So I developed a technique that was already established by Professor Charles Sherrington that is called the decelebration technique. So I developed my own, improvised my own technique on that. So I used to remove the entire forebrain of the animal out and uh, until the mammillary bodies. And I used to keep the animal alive for three to four days. And that removed the uh, dependency of the animal on anesthesia. And that was the first time I, could, I, I realized that the forebrain is not required for life. Mm -hmm. So you, something could be alive for three to four days, even after removing the forebrain out. And then I started to inject specific neurotransmitters into the cells. So if you stimulate the uh, uh, brain by electricity, it will stimulate the cells, but also the fibers of the passage. So you will not know where the effect is coming from. Is it produced by the cells or it is produced by some other integration cell? So I developed a technique which is called excitatory amino acid technique where I could take glutamate agonist and inject two to three nanoliters into a specific group of cells. And during the discovery process, in one place, we discovered a, 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 an area called the periaqueduct or gray in that area. If you stimulate in one area, uh, the part of the PAG, the cattle go meow. In another area, the cattle go howling. In another area, the cattle go growling, crying. So we could generate so many different types of uh, sound behaviors, and that was a highly cited paper published in present over a series of papers. So we realized that there are two systems, one to produce sound and the other one to convert sound. Prior to that, what changed my mind was a fellowship I did with James Watson. I started my medical training and I had the opportunity to come under the tutelage of James Watson. I was a butler for him for two months at a Woods Hole Fellowship. So he told me that, Harry, why are you interested in, in disease? Understand health. Why are you interested in pathology? Understand physiology. Mm -hmm. And that was a defining uh, moment in my life. So I went from my PhD, I went to do my postdoc at Karolinska Institute. And I worked with Professor Sten Grenner, who was a dyno of locomotor neuroscience. He was the first person to show that lamprey, which is a primitive species that you stopped evolving 500 million years ago, is like a eel, it's like a little fish. And the lamprey spinal cord was a blueprint of the human spinal cord. Oh. So he had discovered many principles of locomotion. Our uh, left leg is positioned while the right leg can move. Uh, he had coined many different areas called, one of the areas called the mesencephalic locomotor region, which now we are trying to neuromodulate to see whether we can make a stroke patient mobile again. So some of the basic discoveries came from him. So I trained with him on locomotor circuits, and then I went to Groningen from there. I got my first appointment as an assistant professor in experimental neurology and neuroscience in Netherlands. I established my own laboratory, and in that laboratory, I investigated the entire brain stem. If you want to breathe, if you want to eat, if you want to run, for example, you want to box, 
you only say I'm emotional, I'm going for boxing. But the respiration has to change. Yeah. Cardiovascular system has to change. The rectum has to close. Or else you'll be defecating while you're boxing. So the entire integration of the body has to happen for you to bring that emotional expression. If you want to laugh, you need to recruit the oral, perioral, a genioglossus, geniohyoid, hypohyoid, laryngeal, pharyngeal. Everything has to be in a symphony for you to laugh. So I established a laboratory to study the brain stem emo uh, control of the emotional motor system. And that led to many discoveries which now be adapted in neuromodulation. Then I established models of neuromodulation. So many neuromodulation, uh, what we call KOs in Europe, they used to visit my laboratory to understand microcircuitry and how we can stimulate these microcircuitry to uh, revive a uh, uh, change of few disease settings. Some of them included urinary incontinence. And some of them included uh, mobility, uh, orthostatic hypotension, uh, chronic hypertension, uh, anxiety loss. And uh, on all these were examined from brainstem point of view. And then when you put the full brain on it, it becomes a disease like OC, like a, 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 a Parkinson's disease, like Pasteur dementia, like Alzheimer's. So the brainstem exploration and animal models that I established <clears throat> became the foundation for many of the neuromodulation principles that now I lead in Boston. Very interesting. So from there, I came to Boston Scientific and I became the chief scientist of Boston Scientific and I brought the entire neuroscience into it. So we, Boston Scientific developed some of the best neuromodulation therapy programs so they are able to kill tremor with uh, uh, deep brain stimulation. But now we are interested in what is the neuroscience behind it? Is DBS only a symptomatic therapy or is it a disease reversing therapy? So interesting that you actually spoke about uh, deep brain stimulation. Very keen to know that neuromodulation <laughs> and deep brain stimulation, are they one and the same or is DBS one part of neuromodulation? Well, neuromodulation can be both invasive and non-invasive. For example, transcranial magnetic stimulation is also neuromodulation. Okay. Electroconversive therapy is also neuromodulation. The cells are intrinsically neuromodulating cells. The cells fire and they stop fire. When some dysfunctionality happens to these cells, we bring the external neuromodulation to yeah. make them fire. That is called upregulation or stop them firing. We, we downregulate. So, invasive neuromodulation is deep brain stimulation, whereas non-invasive neuromodulation is focused ultrasound into transcranial magnetic stimulation and TCDS. And these three are gaining uh, a high level of uh, resolution for dementia. Very interesting. In fact, uh, you have done extensive work in the treatment of uh, neurodegenerative, neuropsychiatric, neurodevelopmental and neurogenic autonomic disorders, right? What are the common and specific conditions that are treatable and manageable through neuro neuromodulation? Basically, in the, in the brain, there is nothing like absolute brain death. Mm -hmm. So, brain has been compartmentalized. And we know that brain stem is involved in autonomic control. Uh, cerebellum is involved in very fine head movement. Uh, four, brains are, four brain structures are involved in the whole range of sensory and motor processing. But when there is a problem in the cerebellum, there are a few cells or a few thousand cells or a few million cells become necrosed. It leads to a certain type of cerebellar ataxia. Good. Right? The same case in an area called the, the thalamus. There is an area called the uh, substantia nigra. And when some cells die or uh, predominantly 50% of cells become necrosed, it causes Parkinson's disease. So there are two components to it. One is that when the cells die or when the cells become necrosed, they're not able to produce a chemical that is required for smooth motor control. But the other aspect is, they're not completely dead. So the concept of neuromodulation needs to be, for those cells that are partially uh, uh, firing, it aids them to come back to a certain level of firing capability. Okay. But necrosis of the cells can also lead to the cells firing in a wrong way. In the wrong way. For example, when you eat, the breathing has to momentarily, momentarily stop, the gut is opens, and the foot goes. But then when there is a dysfunctionality over there, we call that dysphagia, swallowing disorder. Because there is an integration between breathing and swallowing is not perfect. In the same principle, integration does not happen because of that some cells become rogue firing cells. Right. So they fire excessively than what they need to fire. So the neuromodulation is supposed to bring them, calm them down. So this principle, when we adapt it to specific micro mm -hmm. which have been discovered to cause a particular disease, and then we can hit that. Could you name some of those diseases? Which are very popular and very prevalent? Parkinson's. Oh, I see. Okay. We have done 300,000 patients are now walking, having an extremely good quality of slides because we brought here over mission. We brought DBS. That's wonderful to hear. And we have patients at the age of 45 
who now develop early onset of Parkinson's. And, and, they, and Parkinson's often goes for 20 years, 25 years. And Parkinson's patients don't die of Parkinson's, mm -hmm. they die of pulmonary aspiration pneumonia, some mm -hmm. brainstem disorder. So until the disease progresses all the way to the brainstem circuits, they're alive. So we need to bring that quality of life forward. So when we neuromodulate specific microcircuitry, which we know can help in reducing the tremor, uh, bringing down the rigidity, bringing down the skinesia, that brings the people out. I have a patient. The patient used to, she used to tell me that she acts very strong tremors. And she had difficulty sleeping with her husband in the same bed. Mm. Right. For several years, she has not slept in the same bed as her husband because yeah, this goes. In the sleep, also there is a mind. Mm. Sometimes these tremors, whether it is a part of the system or not, we do not know. They might have comorbidities like <clears> urinary incontinence, <throat> PD triggered urinary incontinence. So she will just urinate when the tremor gets it extremely violent. It just releases a bad. So these people now come back and tell me, I'm able to go to the movies. I'm able to have an ice cream. I'm able to run. I'm able to jog. I'm able to go back to work. So neuromodulation can apply itself in so many different areas. But the important thing, there are two requirements for it. One is we need to identify the precise circuitry which can be neuromodulated. Say in the cases of multiple systems atrophy, we do not know the precise, precise circuitry. That's why we call that multiple systems atrophy. The entire brain gets affected. But there's no load to be done. Yeah. In the case of multiple sclerosis, we don't have an understanding of either. But in the case of, say, Alzheimer's, we have some understanding of it, right? So we can bring in neuromodulation to reverse cognitive deficits in Alzheimer's. And the same can apply for vascular dementia. So we have an understanding of which circuits could be neuromodulated so that the cognitive deficits of <laughs> vascular dementia can come down. In fact, very interesting. Uh, these are uh, some of the neurodegenerative disorders that we are talking about and we deal with them, be it uh, Parkinsonism or... Uh, Alzheimer's and different forms of dementia, right? We've always uh, understood that these are degenerative in nature, right? But what are the benefits of uh, neuromod application of neuromodulation in such cases, more specifically DBS? Do you see from your research programs any improvements or maybe reversals of some of these conditions? In PD space, in movement disorder space, whether it's Parkinson's disease or essential tremor or dystonia, we have anecdotal evidence to show that DBS is actually producing neuroplasticity. That means it is reversing the disease state. Oh, the quality of life is phenomenal. Interesting. Right? So you have, a, there are people who have gone back to work. People have gone back to sky jumping. I have multitudinal stories that I can share with you. Very inspiring. Later on. Yeah. As we bring the neuromodulation perspective to other diseases, if we are able to see neuroplasticity in the motor circuits, I would expect the same neural spasticity to be much higher in the sensory circuits. That leads me to ask you a question saying that what kind of research is happening, especially in the field of Alzheimer's and Parkinsonism, uh, what sort of research is happening in the world right now? Basically, our focus on uh, any of these neurodegenerative result is on a research is to understand the etiology of the disease. Where does it start? What are the molecular factors that trigger the disease? So we have some understanding, say in the case of uh, Parkinson's disease, we now understand that it is actually an alpha sign nucleopathy. To the extent that we often believe that this is a gut biomaxis. So, so for example, alpha sign nucleopathy is a protein that is produced in the gut and is transferred into the uh, brain, it is deposited in the brain, and that often expresses itself as a sign nucleopathy, and PD is a part of the sign nucleopathy. In the case of Alzheimer's, amyloidosis. Excessive amyloids and tau proteins are produced in specific portions of the brain, and that causes immediate Alzheimer's. So the neuroscience field is all about engineering those specific animal models to understand that. So once we are able to understand the molecular fabric of the disease, then we construct from the molecular fabric the circuitry that is involved. Understood. In fact, uh, there's a very interesting question that came up to me when I was meeting up with you saying that, do you have any criteria for selecting such candidates, especially in the elderly, if they have to go through DBS and such a later neuromodulation program? For the PD, there, do, there, there is no such criteria. I see. PD is a progressive disease. Yep. First, it starts with trouble. Yep. Then progressively, you will have difficulty with your urination. There are many PD patients who suffer from acute insomnia, yeah. dysphagia, difficulty to swallow, and, and then dysarthria, yeah. difficulty to pronounce words. So it, it never stays only as movement disorder. Actually, I've been okay. championing and lobbying to classify PD not as a movement disorder, but also as a psychiatric disorder. Because oh. apathy... And uh, head roping is a very common feature in PD. Okay. So in that space, 
<coughs> the DBS does wonders. And there is no necessary criteria that you should be of this kind of that kind. Of course, the patients still have to go through cardiovascular assessments, some psychiatric assessments, yeah. neurophysiological assessments. Very interesting. Well, in fact, that leads to a question saying that uh, uh, you will obviously collaborate with surgeons and physicians, right? How does the whole process work if somebody wants to get the benefit of neuromodulation? The first thing is to see a good, for example, in the PD space. Let us stick to the PD space. It's very well defined. Globally, there are what we call movement disorders patients. There are, there are neurologists who have now gone ahead and done an additional fellowship I see. Uh, to understand movement disorder concepts and movement disorder aspects of it in the neurology field. And then there is this functional surgery. It's called functional experimental stereotactic surgery. And these are neurosurgeons who know how the implant leads into the brain. Oh. So they train in that. So the pathway for a PD patient is from his family or her family physician or whatever that system is. They have to finally reach the, the movement disorder specialist to things well. In the West, we also have huge uh, PD uh, adv advocacy groups, advisory groups. And Boston Society because, has revolutionized the neuromodulation because yep. we have the differentiated technology called MICC. So they can call our call center and understand and find out about it. So there is a wealth of information available of, yeah. about, there are Facebook groups, there are YouTube groups. So there are a wealth of information available. But thanks for saying that. I think we also need to publish some of these uh, information about <laughs> health groups that can come into play. We will do that. But it is growing in India too. In fact, you spoke very extensively about uh, the neuromodulation <laughs> and neurosciences itself. <laughs> Anything that you want to share with our uh, viewers about the latest development in this field, specifically to help seniors and elderly? When you first sta start to notice that there is a small tremor in your pinky finger, go and consult a good neurologist. Mm -hmm. Do not take it for granted. Do not think that they, I'm old, it is very common. Uh, what can I do? I'm old. I've seen this in my father, in my brother. Do not bring prejudgmental factors into it because we have no idea what that is. It could be just an age-related uh, muscular dysreflexia. It could be an uh, essential tremor. It could be a uh, dystonia. It could be ED. Very interesting. We see that, you know, this kind of a phenomena applicable to across the spectrum as well. Even if it uh, start talking about dementia or Alzheimer's also, try to catch them early mm. so they can do some interventions. You have been traveling extensively across the globe, right? And we have seen different countries and different settings and how people uh, are taken care of in those settings, etc. And the advancement of science and technology. Uh, on a comparative basis, how do you think India is doing? India is evolving tremendously in Europe. Tremendous. Because I'm here to meet key physicians or what we call key opinion leaders. That's very good to hear. And in fact, I know that you have been working with some of the government agencies and organizations from an advocacy perspective also. Is there anything that you would like to share saying that what's the kind of a perspective that they are getting right now or trying to take an approach towards these neuromodulation as a science? I may not be exactly precise in this because I'm still an outsider. But I'm being told now that any more device clinical trials means that you need to recruit Indian patients. Mm -hmm. So if you want to bring in device technology into India, Indian patients have to be a part of it. Oh, I see. So that is a tremendous uh, policy that has been made by the uh, central government, which allows us to bring the therapy to India. Very interesting. So from that perspective, as the therapy grows, I'm sure there are many different, de many definitive reinforcements that will step in. Absolutely. Regulatory reinforcements. Absolutely. Right. So I see a very bright future for uh, Parkinson's disease pit. That's very interesting. You know that the scope is getting widened and <laughs> absolutely the horizon is getting widened over there. But a very different topic, right? There could be some uh, students who are watching this program. I think what is your advice to youngsters who are wanting a career in neuromodulation? You can either go on the engineering side or on the medicine side or on the neuroscience side because neuroscience is the foundation for neuromodulation. I was telling this morning to uh, one of our top KO here in Bangalore saying that neuroscience without neurology and neurology without neuroscience is a blind alley. Yeah. Right. Both needs to converge. So the student should pick these three avenues. If you go in the engineering side, you're involved in mathematics and you are in algorithms, predictive modeling, device development. You go on the neuroscience, you basically tell the neurologist where to hit, yeah. what to stimulate, how that circuit behaves. And if you're a neurologist, you're providing the care. I'm sure there are a lot of people who would have more questions to come back to us. Just before we wind up, uh, you have had a tour of our uh, geriatric care center. <coughs> I did see you speaking to our leadership team and giving them a lot of encouraging words. 
So a uh, few uh, thoughts from you about the services that we provide. Uh, and this is a very early stage in India, if you look at the sector, which is probably a bit advanced in some of the developed countries that you come from, right? So we basically provide out-of-hospital care for seniors and elderly, covering all the three spectrums, which is your post hospitalization or post-operative rehabilitative program. Mm. Number two is your hospice and your palliative care program. And finally, uh, caring for persons with dementia and Alzheimer's uh, and different forms of dementia. Mm. Uh, some thoughts from you before you end up, uh, Dr. Subramanian? First of all, I have to congratulate you immensely. Because this is, uh, what I saw is awesome. You, you are alive until you drop dead. So there is a psychological perception that you're old. That's how much you can be. Just sit in the corner and pray. Or don't worry about it. We will take care of you. Or we will not take care of you. But this is your fate. To fight against that uh, concept. To bring a psychological bent of mind. And to bring, to start a facility like this from scratch. <clears throat> bring in geriatric care. Integrate the geriatric care with different consultants that you have. For example, you know, just will come and see a stroke patient. You have a physiotherapist who provides this. Uh, for this kind of a service to this particular yeah. patient. Yeah. So to integrate that with very different uh, client across, I think it's a phenomenal achievement. Loneliness can be the biggest uh, trigger for dementia in many elderly yeah. patients. So that kind of a facility also brings joy to those people who are living here. At the same time also brings joy to persons like me. For example, I know a lot of my, our own DBS patients who have undergone uh, uh, DBS implantation. They would love to come and stay in your facility like this for a little bit of a management of their disease, post-DBS. Probably bringing in Ayurvedic concepts to more holistic healing principles. So there are many aspects that you can integrate with the facility that you have developed. Thank you so much. Very encouraging. Cool. I think uh, some of the thoughts that you have shared with us is not only encouraging for us, but cool. the entire industry which is, is in a formative stage in India. And I think we would like to collaborate with people like you, experts like you who work across the world and bring the knowledge. And our objective is to see how we can take this knowledge to the clientele and the patients and ultimately benefit them. So it's been a wonderful uh, uh, time having you in our facility, hosting you and uh, spending this time of discussion and acting a lot of information out of you, which is going to be very useful for people. I want to take this opportunity to really thank you for taking your time amidst your busy schedule. We hope to have more engaging conversations with you in the next trip. So thank you so much, uh, doctor. It's my Sorry. pleasure. Thanks, Doc. Congratulations. Uh, again, congratulations on this. Thank you so much. Really wonderful.